Hi, Thomas. Hello, and then how are you today? Yeah, it's very, very nice and uh, to see you and to be on with the internet. Yeah, with you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's great to have you here. Uh, today, my guest is Thomas Stutzle. He's a yes. research director of the French National Science Foundation, working at the Iridia Laboratory of Université Libre de Bruxelles. He has co-authored three books, among which are Stochastic Local Search, Foundations and Applications, and Ant Colony Optimization, both being the main references in their respective areas. His other publications include more than 250 articles in journals, international conferences, or edited books, many of which are highly cited. His main research interests are in stochastic local search algorithms, swarm intelligence, multi-objective optimization, and automatic design of algorithms. Thomas is best known for his contributions to early advances in end colony optimization, including algorithms such as MaxMean and System, the establishment of the algorithmic framework for iterated local search, and as a driving force in the advancement of automatic algorithm configuration techniques and their usage in the automatic design of high-performing algorithms. He's an associate editor of Applied Mathematics and Computation, Computational Intelligence, Evolutionary Computation, International Transactions in OR, and Swarm Intelligence. He's also a member of the editorial board of seven other journals. In 2019, Thomas suffered a stroke that affected, among other things, his ability to remember words, but he has improved a lot and he's now working full time again. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Uh, I've been citing your work throughout my entire career, so it's an honor to have you here. Yeah, it's an honor for me to uh, be with you here. It's uh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's start. Um, how old are you now and where are you from in Germany? Yeah, I was born at the end of uh, 1968 in Donauwörth, and uh, this means now that uh, at the time of recording, I'm still 54 years old, yeah, but not anymore very long. Yeah. You may wonder where Donauwörth really is, yeah? Well, it's about uh, 100 kilometers from Munich and in the northwest of Munich, yeah? Well, it's Munich. I think everybody knows at least where it is. Yeah. So uh, the main, well, not the main town, but one of the main towns of Germany. Yeah? About my hometown, it is more specifically 40 kilometers north of Augsburg, which is a town with, which, with about 250,000 inhabitants. And is it? Uh, uh, it's the what the word is saying at the rid of the Donau. Yeah? It has about 20,000 inhabitants, so it's a small town, and it has the river Wernitz. Uh, it has the two rivers, the Donau and the Wernitz. Uh, that the Wernitz is uh, which goes into the river Donau uh, in, in my hometown. Yeah? And maybe it is best known for being the only place in Germany which builds helicopters. It is uh, something like, it's astonishing, 7,000 employees. It came, by the way, also in my life a bit to a helicopter when I had to do some practical work for my studies. I did maybe uh, six or seven months of a real practical work for the studies. Uh, at that time, uh, it was called MBB for Message with Velcro Blown, I believe. Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot of uh, interesting information from your hometown. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's interesting to uh, observe that actually you work in Belgium, you are from Germany, but right now you're in Chile. Uh, so yes. <laughs> by chance, yes. yeah, by chance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, what about your parents? Uh, what did they do for a living? Um, my parents got married very young. Uh, it, uh, my mother was uh, eight, uh, 19 uh, and my father was 21. Yeah? So, but it uh, seemed to be quite normal then. Yeah? Uh, when I was born, uh, he was a truck driver, my dad. Yeah? He drove gravel and things uh, like that. Yeah? Uh, my mom, they, she worked at the time in a company called Südstall. Uh, but left it when I was born there. Yeah? She then afterwards worked at the lottery place and the travel agency, which was organized by the same crew. 
And uh, perhaps what I should say is that my mom got a heart attack when she was about 40 years old. Well, uh, she survived it, but uh, then she stayed most of the time home and stopped, well, kind of stopped working. And so she is uh, even now. So, and now they are uh, 80 is my mom and 20, uh, 82 is my dad. Yeah. Uh -huh. um my mom is 80 and my dad is 83 so it's it's similar to yeah they're exactly from the same generation yeah um and are you an only child yeah i'm the only child uh, my parents had yeah it was okay back then but uh, when i was getting old uh, if i had children and i have children then at least two yeah and now i have two <laughs> Okay. And how was life in your hometown uh, during the 70s and 80s? Uh, once one has to remember that school was only until uh, 13 o'clock. Yeah? And, and from then on, one had free time, but some homework. The to homework took something between, yeah, but uh, it's, it's one and two hours. Uh, one and two, yeah, sometimes three hours in the afternoon. After the homework, we most of the time went out to play with some friends and read magazines or books. Uh, and uh, this I did quite frequently, yeah. Other than that, in the evening, often I watched television, so, yeah. Well, huh. like in, not like everybody, but I was watching uh, quite a bit of television, yeah. Huh. It was not always quite entertaining like this, and sometimes I felt a little bit bored. But that is maybe also good because then you have to choose something that makes you a more interesting life. Yeah? So. Uh -huh. so, did you practice any sports, for example? Uh, yes, I was doing various things. Yeah, among those, I first played table tennis when I was young. So maybe from nine and ten years old uh, years uh, and forward. But I did not so good. Yeah, when I was a little bit older, around fifteen years old, a friend brought me to handball. Yeah, and which I really loved. And I was then not a major player, but I had uh, to be out of team uh, for which I was pretty good there yeah? and that time I made in one match I know I remember it was 17 goals yeah this <laughs> this is the story of my life which uh, well it's also quite extraordinary yeah? uh -huh. so, very interesting uh, did you do well in school I did quite well at school yeah it was usually one of the best in my class but not necessarily the best there were always some one or two girls, maybe it was girls that were better than me. One of these was the, was the daughter of the later director of the school. Yeah, so uh, she did really very good. What impressed me uh, of her was that uh, at the university later she studied, I think, kinotherapy or something like this, or similar, which she was using for her younger brother, which was severely disabled. Yeah. One of my worst classes was actually music and arts. Yeah, it is astonishing uh, because I really like listening to music, but maybe not <laughs> that is not the type of music you'd listen to at school. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, uh, what has to be said is that I studied seven years of Latin. Latin is my first foreign language. This was for my first year at the gymnasium, uh, the German word for the high school. What is also strange in Germany is that the students start very early. In my case, it was the fifth class at the gymnasium, and then it stayed on at the gymnasium for uh, up to the 13th class. Yeah? In Germany, one has 13 years of school, where it, uh, whereas in most other countries, at least in Europe, one has 12 years. Only recently, uh, people did for some Bundesländer also a 12-year curriculum. Mm -hmm. Having said this, um, my uh, main subjects at school have been math, physics and chemistry. I got them reinforced when I was at the ninth year and uh, actually math and physics were the two major subjects in the last two years of my school. Yeah, yeah. but you, you mentioned a lot of things there, but what was your favorite class? Yeah. 
are honestly history yeah? and obviously phys physics and chemistry. Yeah? Mathematics was also fine. I did my abitur, the latest degrees in school in physics, mathematics, history, and German. Yeah, one, one had to uh, take uh, something. The uh, physics and mathematics was, the, was my uh, major subject, and from the uh, uh, other ones, one had to take one. It was history, and one uh, it was German. My favorite then was the history class, uh, uh -huh. the, uh, the subject was the beginning of the Nazi regime, yeah? it was an oral exam by the way, and it was it was also the, the best class, uh, the best mark I could have, yeah? uh -huh. it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah you mentioned that, uh, uh, Germany played a fundamental role in the first and second world wars, uh, how were these facts portrayed in your history classes? I do not know the details. It was so many years ago. Uh, if I if I think back, it's about 40, 40, degree, uh, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it was uh, in the First World War. It was the problem that the Austrian uh, troll war, war, was shot in. Yeah, I think Serbia in Serbia, mm -hmm. and based on this, about two or one month later, the World War broke out, and at the end, the Germans and Austrians lost. The Germans, uh, and more or less the Austrians, really began this war. But I think that it was overall, the, uh, it was a kind of war. One begins, and the other were, were waiting for it. Yeah? The interesting stories start with the end of the war, and that goes until the 1933, when the Nazis, the, uh, the NSDAP, uh, got in the power. Yeah, these are only this. These are fifteen years. Yeah, which is nothing. Yeah, for the Nazi, and uh, the for the Nazis, uh, it was the beginning of the party uh, in Germany. And this uh, twenty for uh, twenty one years for the Second World War. Yeah, I have to say that is no doubt that the Germans uh, were really the let's say. <laughs> Yeah, the evil to start the war, yeah, the Second World World War, yeah, and is now it's is how it's portrayed in the history classes, and actually it's like it was, yeah. So, did any of your family members go to war? Uh, yes, both grandparents were going to the war, yeah. In fact, one of uh, them, my uh, grandparents, was in the. Uh, 100,000 army, which was there until uh, 1933. Yeah, but one one has to know that uh, 100,000 people were uh, there. The limit for the German army yeah, until 1933, uh, until Hitler made it. Yeah, this one got injured with a problem on the foot, but not something major. The other one also went to the war. He was against the Russian army, and at this time he lost one eye. Yeah? So actually, he got an eye glass and he could take it out, and he did it also with me <laughs> in front of him watching it. Okay. <laughs> you grew up during the Cold War. Did that have any impact on you, and did you have to undergo military service? Uh, yes, uh, it had an impact, but I would say not a major one. I had to go to the military service for 15 months. Uh, I did this in the year 1988 to 1998, uh, 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 from the 1st of July to the 13th of September. Yeah, So it was essentially at my hometown. Actually, it was a pouring time uh, where one sometimes during a day had almost nothing to do. Yeah? So I began speaking Spanish in this time. Yeah, I started from zero, but really from zero, and uh, to uh, write something in six or twelve months. Yeah, uh, I always had a book with three thousand words with me, and for each word one sentence. And this is how I learned it. Yeah, at the end I knew close to everything in this book. Yeah. Okay. That's so. My Mm -hmm. So the military service was useful for you to learn a Spanish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Useful, yes. nice. Uh, you have an equivalent to a master's degree in business engineering from the University of Karlsruhe. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this similar uh, to industrial engineering, and why did you choose this degree? Um, 
Uh, well, uh, there are six different types of industrial engineering and management in Germany at this time. Yeah, I was choosing Karlsruhe because it had a very broad perspective. And interestingly, it was the uh, one who had uh, least industrial engineering. Yeah, so it's mainly uh, is industrial engineering, but minor. Yeah? I rather took it because one could have later on a lot of operations research, statistics, and at that time, what was computer science. Yeah? Right. And when did you discover R? Well. The first lecture in our R was only in the third uh, in the third year of the studies, yeah. And then we started with linear programming and so on. Actually, I found uh, something on linear optimization at my hometown in a small library when I was maybe eighteen or and so on. Yeah, there I could read on a chapter on linear programming and thought, oh, that's something like I wanted to do when I stay, later study on it. Yeah. This is how it, how it went. Yeah, so. Very nice. Uh, so you, you had uh, access to some uh, OR content before uh, starting the program. Uh, and when you, when you read that book in the library, that gave you some idea of what to study in, in the university, probably, right? Yeah, yeah. This mm -hmm. was it. Yeah. So it was something I really wanted to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you spend a period abroad as an exchange student? Uh, yes, uh, I applied to get a visiting position in Spain. You may wonder why Spain. So there are two things. One is that I liked Spain a lot from previously. I have visited Spain each year in my summer vacations, usually be doing a language course for one month and then something else. Yeah. Actually, I did there also a practicum at MPP, so uh, the former uh, Eurocopter, which was in the helicopter firm in uh, Donauwerth, yeah, my hometown. The second reason is that in Spain, one could study operations research, uh, statistics and computer science at the mathematics uh, university. And this is what I did there. Yeah. It was nice doing it, but it was also tough doing it because it was at the mathematics uh, the, uh, faculty. Nevertheless, well, I think I did okay. One thing I, uh, that I learned to know, it's Maria Jose, yeah, which is now my wife. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Really yeah, very important, very important uh, yeah. exchange period. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you got your diploma in 1994. Uh, what did you do afterwards? Yes, I got graduated in November 1994 yeah, in the statistics department. Yeah, By uh, then, I had already achieved another grant by the Foreign Ministry of Spain for eight or nine months. So I had some freedom there. Yeah. I also uh, lived uh, there with my time uh, with, my, with my girlfriend. Yeah. During this year, when I was then in Spain, I did what in Spain is kind of the first year of a doctorate. It is essentially doing studies on some things that are afterwards related to a doctorate. The two subjects I got really interested in, it was uh, the introduction into what uh, today one could call bioinformatics and another topic what is the materialistics where we studied simulated annealing table search and genetic algorithms among other things this was very interesting and i took me some time also to do a genetic algorithm for doing the chop chop scheduling problems uh-huh uh and why did you go to darmstadt for your phd uh well I had uh, for Spain only the money for eight or nine months, yeah, and then the future was uncertain, yeah. Well, see me, seeing it from now, I could have probably had some uh, way of saving at the beginning a, a PhD study also in Spain. So, um, wow. But anyway, I was invited to Darmstadt at the computing science department for an interview for a PhD position, which was on the graduate colleague. Uh, well, it was a computer science department, uh, and in the department it was the Intellectics crew, which is a group in automated theory proofing, of which I had no idea whatsoever. Yeah? 
It was headed by Professor Diebel, who was in Germany, but also out of Germany. It was one of the major heads in uh, this artificial intelligence. And you know what? Uh, I don't know why, yeah? but he selected me. You work on several meta heuristics during your PhD, including table search and colony and iterated local search. However, you became more known for the latter two. How did you end up working with end colony optimization? Oh, uh, well, one has to first day say that I started with the PRP in the thesis. Yeah? It became uh, for me after three or four months uh, too ambitious with the infrastructure we had in the lab. Namely, well, the infrastructure was nothing. Yeah? So I asked uh, my, uh, this Professor Bibel whether we could have a meeting for the PhD thesis. Yeah? I think it was in November. And he said, yes. Uh, for sure, but uh, in February, in February next year, <laughs> uh, pff, uh, it's February. And anyway, uh, this is when I started with Tabo Search, and, and I was doing it for solving constraint satisfaction problems, and it works r really nice and nicer than uh, Rainer uh, Walk, uh, which was then uh, the kind of things that one was doing. Yeah? But now to the ACO, yeah? I started at the time the meta heuristics, and it was the time where the first really uh, large journal article on Unsystem appeared. Uh, this was the Unsystem optimization by a colony by Marco de Rigo and others. I presented this in the uh, meeting meeting we were doing uh, on interesting stuff we have found. Then a friend of mine, was Holger Hus, who was doing the, uh, at the same time the PhD. He said, uh, well, uh, we can do better than this. We only uh, need to do one day of implementation. Well, it was uh, one always needs to evolve the estimates, but in two days we had it. We had uh, implemented the ANT system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, could you briefly comment about the max mean ANT system that you became known for? Yes, uh, Max Binan system is the uh, thing we came up with. It has uh, three modifications with respect to the ARN system. First of all, it uses the best so far ARN for the pheromone updates in, instead of all the ARNs at, uh, as it was done in the ARN system. This already improved the conversions and also the solution quality with respect to ARN system. But we thought it was not good enough since sometimes it had also not so good results. Yeah? Then we came up with upper bound and the lower bounds to limit the feasible uh, values of the pheromones. This also did improve the results quite a bit. The, th the third element was that we initialized the pheromones, uh, we uh, uh, reinitialized the pheromones in the um, to the upper limit, yeah, and uh, not to the lower ones, in some or something in between. This uh, did re uh, improve the results on the TSP where we tested it. This was also the thing that we tested on the TSP, and it gave good results. But we also added a local search to it, uh, two opt, and uh, then I think also uh, three opt, and we published this as a technical report in August uh, 1996. It then went on in part of my research, for example, uh, using it for uh, different types of problems, so maybe flow shop problems and so on. Mm -hmm. And what about ILS? Uh, what motivated you to work with such a meta heuristic? Uh, I started with this probably in the end of 1997. Yeah? So uh, because it, uh, as I have done at the beginning of uh, 1998, a technical report about this. I started on this because with ACO it was very nice, but it had too many parameters. Then to me, ELS seemed to be something to test. So I was doing the TSP, the QAP, and the Flowshop uh, problem, same as for the Max Minan system. And interestingly, it worked better for the TSP, for the Flowshop problem, and for some parts of the QAP. Only for the QAP, for some parts, ACO was slightly better uh, or about the same. 
I have to say that the ILS works better if, for example, you introduce a restart behavior in it or some other types of acceptance uh, criteria. But anyway, it is kind of better than the ACO and at least for yeah, these three programs. So mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, yeah. Using restarts in uh, ILS framework, uh, it's very useful. Uh, I. I have a lot of experience in that regard, so I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, it seems that the first ILS implementation dates back to 1981 or so, and then there were a couple of others during the 80s and early 90s. Uh, however, the official ILS framework was perhaps formally introduced in your PhD thesis, right? Uh, I would say uh, so we formally introduced it. But let's see. The first uh, who was made, what we know of, was Baxter in 1981. But he is using the ELS idea only for three or four iterations, if I remember well. The person who really introduced it is actually, for me, Baum in 1986 for the TSP. He is using it in some way that doesn't give him a major improvements, but he is using it as uh, what you uh, do when you have an ELS. In his case, uh, I think it's a two opt uh, for the local search, and in the perturbation, I think it's a three opt, or even a two opt. Uh, for some things. So there are uh, two uh, conference papers from Baum. Uh, then there is the work of Oliver Martini, uh, who introduced, as he said, the perturbation with the double bridge move. And as the local search, he was initially using a, a three opt and then later on in Link Kerningham. Lynn Cunningham, uh, for those that do not know it, is the kind of the best local search for the TSP. It is probably like this because uh, his publications are the first one written in 1988 and 1989, but they were rejected and they could only be published in 1991. Yeah. A little bit later, in uh, 1990, uh, Johnson improved this by the link Kerningham algorithms, where in a paper he made the double bridge move together with the link Kerningham, and he got like the best results ever until this time. Yeah? So Johnson would have said that his contribution is only for the TSP, which seems to be a bit odd, but maybe it is of the t a different type of age. Yeah? So I would not say that these were the ELS guys, uh, which is essentially Baum as the main person. Uh, and then we simply published the ELS chapter, which made ELS popular, but that's it. Yeah, yeah you were a fundamental uh, person when it comes to uh, popularizing uh, the use of ILS and formalizing and even, uh, you know, uh, documenting uh, uh, the, even the history of, of ILS. So, uh, yeah. you know, your work was very important, right? Otherwise, uh, I, maybe it would probably be rediscovered and restated, but uh, you guys uh, did, especially you, uh, uh, did a lot, right? No, but uh, you have to also consider that ELS had uh, many different names. It was called chain local optimization, uh, large set Markov chains, and this was all uh, an ELS. Yeah? It's, uh, that's also astonishing. Yeah? Uh, the the thim simple um, the I the simple ideas get uh, published in many different ways and are called differently and are actually the same. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Astonishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens quite a lot in meta heuristics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, is it true that you became quite disappointed with your PhD thesis? Uh, yes and no. I have to first say that my uh, thesis uh, contained all the work I probably did on many things. This is the ACO with the development of our max -min system, but also the work on ELS and the work I did before on the table search. It is a quite a lot. But if one sees it, it, I was having an ELS there. And if you ask me, looks like it's generally performing better than ACO. And there is also a piece of the ACO search for constraint satisfaction problems, which almost 
has nothing to do with the ACO and the ELS, and actually it has nothing to do with this. Yeah, if it, one sees it from that side, I'm actually disappointed uh, since there are I a kind of too many things in the thesis. Um, what did you do after finishing your PhD in 1998? After my PhD, I found a position in Darmstadt, but I was really lucky because uh, I, I have been only the third one in the range of three candidates from the same group of people, the intellectics groups. However, the other two neglected this because they wanted to go to the industry, which I don't know why. So I stayed there as at the intellectics group. But it also used this position to go for a research visit for 15 months to Brussels to work with Marco de Rigo, yeah? So the guy that I know from uh, ACO. Yeah? So, ah. so you developed a strong uh, relationship with Marco de Rigo in, in the years that followed. Uh, how did this collaboration start? Yeah, I think I first met Marco Torrigo at the first ANS conference, which was in 1998 in Brussels. After that, I uh, invited him to become a member of the PhD thesis, which was at the 9th of December of 1989. It's, uh, it's four days before my 30th birthday. <laughs> in the time before the PhD thesis, he invited me to get a Marie Curie uh, fellowship, which I was happy to obtain. During this time uh, with uh, him, we have organized together a Meta Heuristics Network, which was uh, then uh, composed of five universities and um, one industry partner. This was also for me a major result, as it gave me, when returning to Darmstadt, a major research with three or four PhD students. And finally, we began at this time with the ACO book, which was taking, well, it was. Uh, three to four years to write, yeah? so it was quite a lot. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I asked Elena Ramalinho Lourenço about the story behind the ILS book chapter uh, in the Handbook of Meta Heuristics, but I would like to hear uh, your version of the story. Well, it was in the year 2000. Uh, that I got the invitation to write a chapter on ACO by Marco Torrigo and here the Marco Torrigo who got the invitation by Glover and Kochenberger uh, at that time. Uh, I obviously said yes, but about the same time I asked them if it would be okay to publish a chapter on ELS and they said Yes, <laughs> yeah, I was astonished. Yeah, so I had then uh, Oliver Martin and Helena uh, Ramaldinho Lorenzo as the other authors of the chapter. So at that time, in around summer in the year, I think it's 2000, uh, I went to see Oliver and I spent one week with him to get the chapters writing uh, to go on. It was impressive what he did. So Oliver Martin really did uh, some major stuff there. Yeah? And I think uh, that really the pages three to nine or something like this of the, if the, you then take the, um, the chapter, uh, they are entirely based on his ideas. And this is the main part, yeah, yeah what the ELS ideas are about. Yeah? Uh, and uh, Helena brought, as far as I remember, uh, essentially uh, the part on scheduling in the chapter and maybe some other parts of the chapter five and everybody had to uh, uh, on the chapter as a whole and in the end we got it and I think well, uh, quite well together. Yes, that's possibly the reference that I have cited the most. Yeah, no, but uh, it's also uh, sometimes uh, uh, so uh, it was uh, also before it was different uh, kind of things. The one called iterated in Kernighan or uh, the Johnson, and on no paper this is uh, this is giving a meta heuristics, yeah. And other people uh, say it's chain local optimization uh, and so on and so on. And nobody or, or very few people uh, they call it uh, ELS. 
and uh, this this is a problem. So I also have to say a word on metaheuristics. It essentially is, in a way, a much larger, larger things that is actually said. I think that everything that in some sense fits the implementation of, for example, an ELS is an ELS, nothing else. So that holds for standard ELS papers like the one of Palm, but it also holds for many implementation of BNS. So since it is only the perturbation which is varied and then uh, I can do it also with this ELS. So in the end, it is an ELS since the perturbation can be varied. So nothing else. So in the end, uh, this, this, that's it. Uh, this is also why I don't think that I'm the inventor or how you will call it of the term ELS. Actually, uh, I, I was uh, already called uh, some, uh, some, somebody else ELS, yeah? for example, by Mühlenbein, yeah? which I don't, uh, don't understand with, whether it was in talking or whether he made it in a paper. Anyway, he is not the inventor really, if before, for example, Bau was doing it. Yeah? So that's it. You wrote a very successful book on stochastic local search. Uh, what was the reason for writing that book? Yeah, it was uh, together with Holger Hoos, and it was essentially putting together the two PhD theses that we had written together around the time in 1998. So this was the original idea. So um, uh, his uh, uh, thesis was on SAT, uh, the SAT problem, and my thesis, uh, yeah, it was what it was. Then we submitted it to the uh, Martin Kaufman publisher, which was at that time one of the best ones, and it got accepted. Well, uh, what ideally would have done something quick, it went, it went then a bit further than this, but in the end it was the book, Stochastic Logo Search, Foundations and Applications. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I know that book really well. Um, yes. And why did you leave Darmstadt in 2005? Well, it was clear that in Germany you have to leave the university where you are. And I think this is also nice in some sense. I wanted at this time to be a professor in Germany since this was my, pre, uh, my dream from early on. So I did a number of calls to something around 10 years universities in Germany and I got rejected. I got rejected all, all at all of them, minus one in Erlangen. So I went there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny story. Yeah? So I went there together with maybe eight or ten other persons who had an interview with five professors, and I didn't achieve it. I got told by somebody I knew uh, uh, from these five professors that with these research interests, I had no chance to be in the top three of positions anywhere in Germany. So uh, luckily, yeah, luckily, yeah. Uh, it was also that time where the team by Marco de Rigo that had a very good possibility of asking for the FNS positions, so the French uh, National uh, Research Foundations. Well, I got the positions. Uh, this is our friends. And actually, it was uh, also a position for my wife because uh, uh, she liked Brussels a lot. Uh, as uh, an international town, yeah, and Brussels is really an international town. Mm -hmm. For example, it is the hometown of the European Union, so this was yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so you work at ULB, but yeah. you are paid by uh, French Belgium Research Society. Yes. That's it. Uh, there, uh, well, it's uh, it's funny. It's the French Belgian Research Society, so the uh, the French one, and from the French one you get paid because you're uh, one of the um, nice uh, researchers. <laughs> so uh, I was there, and I had eight years of research associate, which was due to uh, which was due to uh, phase 
uh, that they did not recognize my habilitation that I did at Darmstadt. Yeah, but uh, then I was doing four years as a senior research associate and now as a research director. Uh -huh. Could you talk about your award-winning F-Race work, which was the precursor of iRace? Yes, it is a racing algorithm with a given time of uh, candidate configurations. Yeah, at uh, every instant scene, one then uh, applies for all the candidates a statistical test to eliminate candidates that are worth performing. That's uh, what it is for F race because uh, it, the F race was done as a statistical uh, um, uh, test that was employed in this first variant. Mm -hmm. The F test is a test which uses the ranks of the uh, same instance. This is how it generalizes uh, over several instances also. And this is it. I was the supervisor of the project and Mauro, Tar uh, Mauro Piratari was the main implementer who also came up with the idea of using the F test. Uh, Luis and Klaus did some things uh, with the results on the experiments. So that's it. Yeah. Mm. Right. Uh, the iRace package has become uh, very popular to tune uh, meta heuristic based algorithms. Uh, what was your involvement in that project? Uh, when we had I, uh, F race, uh, it was somehow also clear that we can improve it by iterations. Uh, yet it took us five years until we came up with that idea in a paper. With our Beratardi, we did the first version of iRace. <laughs> well, it's funny that the first version of iRace, it's quite the same that we designed in one afternoon in the coffee room of Iridia. We, that uh, Mauro and me, invited then Prasanna to do, in the, uh, to do the implementation and the experiments. This was the first uh, version of iRAS. This then gradually evolved to the iRAS made by uh, Manuel and Jeremy in 2011. And from that uh, time on, it was also uh, public. So from 2011 and not uh, 2016, uh, as many people think. Yeah. It became really known uh, when the, uh, we published the code with the paper in the uh, journal Operations Research Perspectives, where it is also the most cited journal paper of uh, the uh, the journal. By the way, in the year 2016, a uh, paper, there was also Leslie uh, Perez Carceres involved. She did the things on the um, on the time varying per, uh, perspectives. Yeah? You asked me for my involvement. Well, uh, first of all, it was with Mauro uh, uh, Piratari, uh, the iteration mechanism of IRIS. Then I also have dealt with it from the supervisor type positions. Apart from f and i -rays, I was also a bit involved in the param ELS methods for automated configuration, but this was only in the beginning of uh, param ELS. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate more on your recent work related to automated design uh, of uh, meta heuristics, other than iRAS in this case? Yeah, um, well, it has to be said that in most uh, of the papers which are on algorithms which need uh, some tuning, I use in the meantime iRAS. We have done a lot of papers which use iRAS on several issues. Well, one of the uh, first ones in 2010 is, for example, the multi objective results for the Boaco algorithms. That is a multi objective ACO algorithm uh, and colony optimization algorithms. This was a paper which was published by Manuel Lopez Ibanez and me in the ANS conference in 2010 and later in 2012 published as the IEEE transaction paper. We used uh, somehow the same methodology to, uh, to afterwards publish more papers on multi-objective evolutionary algorithms from 2015 to, to till, say, 2020, where Leonardo Becerra was doing the main steps in addition to Emmanuel uh, and me. Mm -hmm. 
Another paper that was published in 2011 was about the incremental PSO algorithms for large scale optimization. Yeah. It was written by Marco Montes, uh, De Oca, and Do uh, Dokan uh, Aydin, and it was about the redesign of an optimization algorithm, which was solved on six steps. The redesign also, uh, was six steps, and at each step, it was using iRays as tuning methods. I must say that an important paper, but a really important one, I think, uh, but uh, not so much. Uh, by, by the operations research community, well, and uh, also with Manuel Lopez in Panes is the 2014 paper on any time behavior of algorithms done with iRays. Why is it so important, you may ask? I think that one needs to go away from designing a methodistics with, in most of the paper, a fixed computation time. One can use uh, uh, S1 call the any time performance, which for time uh, uh, when the algorithm is stops gives the best uh, solution quality. Yeah? This we have done in the 2014 paper with an uncolony optimization algorithms and also with SKIP, the fastest open source MIP solver. So uh, it can be done uh, for meta heuristics and it can be done for MIP solvers. So why not? Mm -hmm. There have been also other papers with Jiang Chung Liao, Jeremy uh, Dubois Lacoste. Uh, Eric Yuan, Franco Machia, and so on, and so on, and so on. Leslie Perez, Federico Panozzi, Albert uh, uh, Francin, and Christian Camacho Villagione. Something I didn't mention so far is the grammar based evolution we designed with the help of iRays. Yeah? <clears throat> Well, it's essentially what uh, one can do with a grammar, uh, also one can do with the parameters of an algorithm. What is important uh, if one wants to use iRays is simply that one has to limit the number of times the recursive element is chosen, and that's everything. And that's that's really what, what it is, more or less. Then we have that a general hybrid stochastic local search algorithm is there. Uh, this is in the early versions. A uh, hybrid SLS algorithm will say that it's a, it's a meta heuristics with a single population that is it's something like simulated annealing, table search, grasp, and so on, or ELS. All these can be really uh, instantiated by an ELS algorithm, uh, simulated the dealing, type of such and graphs, and all the other ones. So by an ELS algorithm. This is it for the simple size. This structure we have also been developing since 2013. One of the recent things made by Friederico Bernardozzi is, for example, applying this to the closure problems. There, he succeeding, uh, succeeded uh, instantiating for all the flow show problems uh, that one has tackled, uh, for, but really for all state-of-the-art algorithms at the time when it was published. For example, in the 2019 paper in Eachra, uh, he published it for the flow show problem with make span, the problem with some completion time, and the total tardiness objective. And uh, this is, uh, anyway, this is the f first paper that one uh, publishes something with flowshow problem with make span and flowshow problem with some completion time and, uh, and also for the flowshow problem with total tardiness objectives. And one has state of the art results for everything. Uh, but anyway, uh, this can be much wider be generalized and this is one of the direction which will be done in the future no? excellent um, recently you co-authored a couple of papers questioning the originality and relevance of a few metaphor based meta heuristics could you comment about these articles uh, 
let me start by saying what we have done. Yeah. So similar to Weiland, so Weiland is the first, well, I, kind of the first one, I think, uh, in his paper from 2010, where he analyzes the harmony search algorithms. We started with a paper on the intelligent water drops, uh, which was shown that it uh, is some form of uncolony optimization. Well, actually, this was always clear to me, and I had this paper, the one on uh, intelligence water drop, there in my to do list since, uh, what do I know, so it's uh, 2012 and 2013, and uh, I never had time really to uh, look at it. Anyway, it was uh, then being developed by uh, Christian Lerato Camacho Villalon and published in a paper in 2018 at ANS. And this continued. So, uh, this was the paper that uh, the intelligence water drops is a colony optimization and nothing else. And this continued until the paper in 2013. Uh, uh, 23, it's, uh, which one has the six misleading optimization techniques and which were, uh, this is also important, yeah, which were the most cited papers uh, of this increase of materialistics. Yeah? So, uh, so, for example, for the Grey Wolf uh, optimization has something like six, seven thousand citations or maybe 10,000 in the meantime. Yeah? Mostly these papers are previously known variations of PSO or evolutionary uh, algor uh, computation. Somehow, like the worst, is a paper which combines the gray wolf and the most famous algorithm, which were in itself previously known variations of uh, PSO, and then it is a whale algorithm. And you know that this is done by uh, one of the same authors in all these three algorithms. It's the same author in um, Grey Wolf and the Moss Flape algorithms, and it's the same author in the Whale algorithms. It's, it's currently one of the most cited papers in metaheuristics. Uh, it's nonsense. <laughs> Uh, it's it's really nonsense, yeah. But it's funny. Uh, well, it's it's not funny. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, amazing, yeah. Apparently, that author became an AI superstar in Australia. Exactly, yeah. It, it was in 2022, I think. Yeah, uh, 2022 or two, 2021. Uh, uh, yeah, he was the uh, the, the way. Uh, the best uh, AI researcher in the world, uh, in, not in the world, <laughs> but in Australia. Yeah, but that, that's nonsense. <sighs> no, okay. So now, uh, why this is so bad? It has to be said that these are some of the most cited uh, of more than 500 plus materialistics of overall. First, it must be useful that these papers are not useful in any sense if they are nothing else than a previously noted algorithm by the other methods. Then there must be also some novelty in these methods. But, uh, but uh, when they can be reduced to, say, PSO algorithms, where it is novel, yeah, in what sense? And also a method for uh, does not uh, have to justify something like a mental heuristic simply by proposing it. It's nonsense. Uh, finally, it is that meta heuristics, if something always is, for example, an uh, exponential distribution, uh, distribution instead of a um, uh, uniform uh, uh, distribution. No, it's not. It's simply uh, it's a variant of some metaheuristics, uh, and that's it, and nothing else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this has somehow harmed the reputation of the community. Uh, but I hope yeah, yeah. that. Uh, things improve in the coming years and uh, especially editors of some some journals they should be really aware of this and sometimes they, they, they are not especially those that are not from OR originally so I think this is quite hard to to address it's a, it's a quite hard problem to address but still 
uh, effort yeah. should be made in, in, in this sense, right? Uh, Thomas, uh, according to the evolutionary computation bestiary, ant colony is one of the first creature-inspired metaheuristics <laughs> ever proposed, and that happened in the 90s. As one of the researchers that helped to disseminate its popularity, do you think that this could have contributed to pave the way for other authors to come up with all sorts of crazy metaheuristics in the last 20 plus years? Uh, the first thing I must say is that the Apple framework still has some ingredients which make it a metaheuristics, namely uh, that it is addressing the solution com uh, components with uh, positive feedback, which is completely different from CRASP and also evolutionary algorithms. Uh, so uh, it's also something that was proposed in 1991 and uh, it was not there before. Yeah? Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, it may have contributed to this growth of materialistics in some way. It was actually, when we did this with Max Min and system, not at all, I was not at all aware that it would contribute to something like this. Also, Max Min is something where one has nothing in nature that I would know, so that it was not at all for the nature-inspired materialistics, I would say. Yeah. But for others, it could be true yeah, that this has contributed to make this art colony optimization for a way to this really awful amount of so-called materialistics. This is, well, it's bad, but it is like it is. So let's change topics. Uh, Thomas, in 2019, you suffered a stroke that ultimately made your life more challenging. When and how did that happen? Uh, it made it really more challenging because if you know uh, that in the beginning, I uh, could speak uh, maybe 20 words of my own language of German. Yeah? which was incredible. Yeah. So, so uh, when it uh, uh, did happen and so on, uh, you want to hear the short story or the longest one? Yeah, yeah I, either, I assume, either is fine. Let's go with the longest. <laughs> yeah, I assume it's the long, yeah. So, yeah. So, so the first uh, thing to be said is it's a sport accident. And it's a sport accident in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah? Um, uh, you, um, you may wonder why I did it. Yeah, so uh, I started it uh, only about six months before because of my son, who otherwise would have done something like Thai boxing. And before he does Thai boxing, uh, I knew that Jiu-Jitsu, well, it's better than Thai boxing. So uh, at the time, uh, I was alone in, in this one, and uh, a guy hit me uh, where it used to hit. So uh, in the artery, it goes into the head, and uh, uh, if you hit the artery, uh, then if you hit it 10 seconds or something like this, then you dismay. And uh, then one has something in the Yitsu is uh, hold it, and then he just holds it, uh, then he goes away, and it, it, that's it. And this is how it, how it, uh, we went. It, uh, so uh, I had this, uh, the, this hit one. I felt a bit dizzy afterwards, but then uh, it went okay until I left the uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu side by car. And then it hit me really like 400 meters away from the uh, exit from the Yitsu uh, when I was there uh, at a traffic light. Uh, there it was, green, red, green, uh, red, and I could not move on. Uh, this was um, astonishing. After maybe so six, seven times, uh, it did go, go on and I drove home. I have to say that my wife was uh, at this po uh, part in Luxembourg, 
for work and my older son was in Poland with a school friend. So the only guy who was home was my uh, little boy. After a while, like 10 min uh, minutes, uh, our neighbor came, yeah. Uh, she is a German uh, Spanish wife. So, so I was home and I was, uh, I wanted to go to the ho uh, hospital because I knew something strange happened, but what is it? Uh, then, uh, so before I drove, uh, because before I drove, uh, really, uh, maybe five minutes before I really went to the hospital, she was coming out uh, and she drove me to the hospital. It was then getting better and better over say one or two hours. Then uh, it really hit me uh, with, with the stroke uh, to a much larger extent. I was not, I'm not uh, really sure, but I think it was after a CT and uh, I, we have, I had to get up and then uh, I have not anything in my memory anymore than oh, uh, one or two minutes or something like this. I must say that uh, our neighbor was also the one who had to say, uh, you operate him or you don't operate him. Yeah, and she said, uh, operate him. <laughs> yeah, luckily. <laughs> and in fact, I was then driven from the Saint Pierre Hospital to the Erasmus uh, Hospital, which is the ULB University Clinic, the ULB where I am working. Yeah, and this was around 1.30 or two uh, o'clock in the morning. And then I got operated uh, in the Erasmus uh, uh, Hospital around uh, 3.30 or 4 in the morning. Yeah, It uh, has to be done relatively quickly because after about six hours, uh, it is not possible anymore uh, to do the operations. The operation essentially had to repair by a stand by a stand here, the artery. So uh, this is really the part where the hit, where the guy hit me before. Yeah? So it was is uh, is a uh, the uh, it was a unit so uh, kind of things. Yeah. Um, so uh, it had to be uh, do the uh, by a stand the artery which was broken in the throat at exactly the position where the guy this guy had hit me. Yeah. Well, uh, my wife, in the meantime, uh, so she uh, came from the, uh, about it's five or six o'clock in the morning. Um, I got to say the first two, yeah, one, two, three days, they were really critical. So they were, uh, does he get it or does he uh, not get it? So uh, so between life and death. Yeah? So. Uh, according to how the operation uh, I take, yeah. And well, <laughs> it was okay with the operation. No? So uh, uh, then that's, uh, that's how it went. Yeah. Well, uh, I can only imagine how shocking it should have been, uh, not only for you, but for your family. And... Yeah, but, yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the thing is, uh, for my wife, for example, it was very shocking. So, and uh, yeah, it was shocking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how did your personal and professional life change after that? Well, it changed quite a lot. So, uh, you know, that it hit my left side of the head, and there I have been, uh, yeah, 10 to 20 percent of the uh, brain, they are simply dead, dead, yeah. So, there's nothing anymore. This was the place in the head uh, that one needs for speaking languages, but it's not the time, uh, the place uh, one needs for understanding. So this, the astonishing thing is you hear something uh, and you understand everything, you, but you cannot say anything. That's astonishing. It was so that basically I knew after the stroke from my own language, maybe 10 to 20 words there yeah, and then nothing anymore. Everything else had to become newly learned for speaking. Other than this, I was having the right leg and the right arm. So please, here is the right uh, arm. It was in not so good shape, but uh, they were very working a bit. So I, uh, it was in the beginning, I could uh, do this uh, with the hand. Yeah. So uh, 
but it was working uh, over time. Yeah, and for this starts again the personal in life. Uh, it uh, took me quite some times, where <laughs> times means, <laughs> yeah, years, to be similar to this again as uh, before my stroke. Well, uh, like this again, it's not like before. There still is the English and the Spanish. Well, the English and the Spanish are before uh, they are more or less equivalent. So the English may be better for the work and the Spanish more for the easy uh, for the life. And to a smaller uh, extent, uh, the German is also involved, which uh, have to improve quite something. So, uh, well, but it steadily is improving. And uh, even now, so this is uh, the, the uh, stroke was on the 28th of June uh, in 2018. And now it's five years or five years and almost uh, half a year uh, that it's uh, gone. So, uh, and uh, still it's, I notice that one improves. So you are, uh, if after five years you are there and you still can improve. Uh, this is uh, astonishing. And there are, uh, well, there are some other things uh, that change life a bit. So, if you're asking me by professional life, it was difficult to improve it and to come up to something feasible. But anyway, as also the doctors told me, you can improve it at a constant pace, which is in the beginning, uh, it's quite faster, but uh, then uh, you uh, go on for years after years. So, a constant pace. And professionally, I started to work once again after maybe eight months or something like this. In the beginning, it was only 20% uh, of the time I would have to do, but it was okay like this because more I could not have done. Yeah, It came then 40% in the summer and then 60% in the winter time after one and a half years. After around two years, I started at 80% of my time. And in the meantime, after more than four years, it is then the full time again. If you ask me uh, whether it is at the same level as before, uh, no, it's not so as before. But I'm getting better and better. Uh, will it uh, sometimes be at a point like before? No, I don't think so. But I'm doing all the things uh, again I have done before, but a little bit slower and in much less time, closer well, to what I have done. To, uh, that's it. Yeah, I do everything again, but well, a little bit slower. Yeah, considering the circumstances, like you were in a, a life and death situation, uh, and you recovered from that. Uh, really critical uh, yeah. period, uh, you you seem to be doing fine. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you have recovered to an extent that you can work and, you know, and do what you were doing before. I understand it's not the same, but... Yeah, yeah it's not the same, yeah. So but, uh, uh, it's, it will never be the same. So it will not be the same, but uh, it's okay. Yeah? So... Yeah. Um, where do you take the motivation to keep on working after having a stroke, and what are your plans uh, for the future? Uh, you know, uh, after having uh, had the stroke, I always had the motivation to keep on doing. So, uh, is it for the vision or not? Uh, keep on doing. So, the stroke really changes some things in your head, and sometimes this is for better mood, and sometimes this is for more uh, worse mood. Mine. Uh, was that I always was on the better mood side, yeah. And I guess this is what me, what let me keep on working. And my future, my future plans don't have a stroke once again, yeah. <laughs> well, other than this, uh, on the private life, be better in a sense, and on the professional life, uh, my main objective is uh, in automatic algorithm configuration, which which will really, uh, I think it will be in 10 or 20 years, all 
race be there and and also in some other parts like uh, it was the metaphor based algorithms or uh, and so on uh, that's one goes away again from this types yeah and maybe some other things and that's it yeah seems seems uh, promising uh, yeah. thomas uh, i I understand uh, this has been uh, also a bit tricky for you to do, uh, but I strongly appreciate your efforts. I'm very thankful for your time, and it's an inspiration to see you, you know, keep on uh, fighting, trying to improve, and mm -hmm. uh, facing the challenges, uh, you know, with a positive attitude. Um, so I'm really grateful, and thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, I must be thankful for you for uh, actually doing uh, this uh, with the YouTube things. Yeah, I find it uh, astonishing that you do it uh, so well. So uh, I'm glad that you do it. So and you are also quite good. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, also, I would like to add that uh, I'm super familiar with your work, as you know, yes. and having the opportunity to connect with you after, you know, uh, citing your work for so many years, it's it has been also a treat and a pleasure. So uh, I would like to thank you also for that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the same. Yeah. So uh, I you have done uh, so many things with iterated local search and other things uh, that uh, I'm happy that you did something like this. Yeah. So, yeah. so Thomas, uh, I wish you all the best. Take care of your health. If you, you want to come here anytime with your family or, you know, just to visit us, John, don't hesitate to contact me. It will be a pleasure to host you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, then. So take care and let's hope we can meet in the future. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Ciao. Bye.